here for our Friday afternoon talk with uh, Bob the Builder, Irvin. How was your week? It was busy. Busy's good. So, yeah, it was fine. You're working on a uh, retrofit, right? We're finishing up a big house. We're working on a deep energy retrofit of an 1800 colonial, which is very exciting. Um, We're going to be doing video about that over the next few months. And then uh, we're, we're just starting a new house. The foundation will be poured next Tuesday. So we're in a transition mode right now, which is fine. Um, Great. Last week, we were talking about um, net zero high performance homes and uh, trying to retrofit um, houses to. And uh, you were saying you wanted to talk more. Excuse me. You wanted to talk more about the envelope. If I recall, well, I wanted to talk about the details and I, I wanted to, uh, I mentioned last week that, that what I'm doing, what a lot of other builders across the country are doing is building houses using Passive House uh, Institute techniques. Uh, Passive House is a German uh, nonprofit and uh, there's also an American nonprofit uh, who I got my certification from, which is Passive House Institute US uh, or FIAS. Um, and the, the whole passive house idea is that you can be in the house passively. You don't have to lower shades. You don't have to turn the. You don't even have to turn the heat down at night. You don't have to light a fire. You just enjoy the enjoy the house. Period. And they tried to design a house that wouldn't need heat in Germany. Uh, they were almost successful, but not quite. But uh, most of the houses in America will need auxiliary heating anyway. And most of us use air source heat pumps. Uh, one way or the other. Uh, so the the goal is to have a house that uses very little heat. And this, this is based on what's happening with the climate because we need to get off fossil fuels. And in order to do that, we've got to stop burning oil, gas, wood, coal. I tried burning coal one time in an old kitchen stove that we had. It was like living, <laughs> living in a locomotive. Uh, good heat, but the smell was was terrible. Uh, we're we're away from that now, and we don't burn anything to stay warm in this house. Uh, it's fantastic, and this is a house that goes back to the into the 1700s. So, if I can do it, you can do it. That's kind of my my philosophy. Uh, it's not perfect. It's not equal to the houses, the new houses I'm building, but it works. So uh, we were talking last year that the the basis for passive house is you have to consider your house as as an envelope. Think of a cooler that's foam cooler with a foam lid. Uh, that's a complete envelope around the food. You need a complete envelope around your house. And that includes usually the basement. Uh, most important thing is air sealing. And I wanted to go spend some time tonight to go through some details of where in the house you should look and what are you looking for and what kind of work might it involve. And the work that it involves really is very individual to the house you're living in because houses vary a lot. First of all, I made a drawing that helps me just think about it. And the red line around the house is, is in, indicates everything within that line is in the envelope. And this happens to be a house without, uh, with a heated attic. So the envelope is the whole house, everything inside the red circle including the basement. And the basement is a key to making your house comfortable. It's not necessarily, it's not just a key to making a house more like a passive house. It's a key to making your house comfortable. And that's, this is part of the reason that I, for 30, 35 years anyway, uh, were trying to figure out how to build better houses. I never quite got there. And I never really understood that the basement is an integral part of the house, whether you want it to be or not. Even if all your fiberglass is on the ceiling of the basement, the basement is still an integral part of the house. So, but this- May I stop you there for one minute? Because I think it's worth noting why that is. The reason is, first of all, the natural pressure barrier that separates the inside from the outside isn't at the ceiling of the basement. It's at the walls of the basement. And secondly, it is next to impossible to air seal and effectively insulate 
between the basement and the first floor. So effectively, no matter, it's, if you insulate most of it, but not all of it, you air seal most of it, but not all of it. That's like leaving a, uh, just one hole in the hull of your boat, you know? It's going to yeah, stick you yeah. anyway. So You've got 30 windows not, in your house to leave uh, one open. It's going to be cold right, in there. Right, exactly. Sorry, I just wanted to make that a little clearer. No, I think that's good. One hole in the boat is uh, is one less than what you need. And so, the average basement has a lot more holes than one. You know, places where, you know, uh, pipes or electric stuff goes through where you've got, yeah. you've got now, HVAC stuff going through. Right. right. Doors that aren't outer doors. And once you once you deal with the outside of the basement, the perimeter of the basement, you can forget about the interior holes because they're all in the same envelope. Right. So the pipe right. going from the basement to the first floor is now no longer separating the the parts of the house. They're just going through different parts of the envelope. In my basement, for instance, I'm sitting in my basement. Uh, it's in the mid 50s here. I have no heat. I haven't had heat down here for several years since I got rid of the furnace and the boiler, I had one of each. So there's no heat down here, but it's, I think the, the temperature of the earth is in the 50s and it doesn't get much below that. It's going to be hard to freeze this space unless the upstairs freezes. It won't be impossible if the upstairs uh, froze, then got very cold and the cold would, would come down and it would be cold down here. But, but basically uh, the basement does not uh, get below the mid 50s in all winter. So it's always comfortable. Um, so the red line indicates three things. It indicates the the envelope, the basic envelope of the house. It, it shows you where the air barrier to the house goes. Uh, and the air barrier is going to be on the inside or the outside or different places in different parts of the house. But this is generally what you're looking at. How do you make a continuous air barrier all around your house? Uh, the second thing is moisture barrier. Uh, we have moist air coming in usually through the basement. Basement concrete is porous. Uh, you may not be getting water through your walls, but you're certainly getting moisture Vapor. through your walls and up through your floor. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the house is moist sometime in parts of the year, uh, it's usually moister than it has to be because there's more moisture coming into the basement than needs to come in there. Um, and that can be dealt with. Uh, the third thing is the thermal barrier. You need a thermal barrier all around your house. You need it on the walls, on the roof, in the floor, and that becomes really the floor of the basement. So most basements have a way to get outside, typically a bulkhead, unless you have a walkout, you know, six foot, eight inch door, you can walk out into the basement into the outside rather, uh, you've got probably a bulkhead where you, where you go up some stairs and out through the metal door. Um, old doors are wood, the new ones are metal. Uh, on the inside, you should have a door, an insulated exterior door, like you have in your front door, your back door, your house. So you need an exterior door that's weather sealed and, and relatively tight. Um, uh, I started to notice that when my wife started putting wool rugs under the kitchen table, we have a tile floor in there, and she said the floor is just so cold. So one time I bought some uh, big double cans of type one spray foam, which is a two part spray foam. And I, I used that to go around my basement and seal spray foam um, that, that sill area all around my basement. With the stone foundation, the one thing you can do that works great is spray foam. Again, uh, foam will stick to rocks and when it leaks, and I've got one area where water comes in pretty much every time it rains, it runs down behind the foam and into the dirt ground and disappears. But the whole thing is insulated. And like I say, the basement now is, is just plain comfortable. I've run into some people who do their whole house with it and others who won't have anything to do with it. Um, I had an interesting experience. I was sitting next to an EPA assistant administrator and she was both a trained chemist and lawyer. And we were on an airplane and we got talking about foam and she said it's never been life cycle tested. Her words, it could be the next asbestos, but we don't know. So. If you're going to use it, make sure to air out your house before you come back in into it.
you know, right. 24, right. 48 hours. Um, again, I've had some, some people, uh, the Climans in the, um, in the book I wrote used, um, what do you call it? Flash and bat. Flash and bat, which was the, uh, foam insulation for a couple of inches which gives you good air sealing, which is great about foam. You know, you spray it in, and any place it sprays, it's now air sealed for you. And, right. Um, well, it does crack. The spray foam does crack. Okay. If you put it, uh, if you put it on a wall and then it gets very cold, uh, it can pull away from the wood. I've seen this mm -hmm. in, in a house that I built. So mm -hmm. there are issues with it. But for a thing like a rock, the top of a foundation and and especially a rock wall and i will just say that i love rock walls i'd love to leave them visible but i'd rather have a, a well insulated house the other things that quite often you find in the basement are holes in the floor quite often there are drains old drains that might go to a pipe that might be connected or disconnected or or whatever and air will come in through those pipes so any other any other holes or things just check them to see if they're open you want to cover them somehow or other so that's the that's the basement in the first floor the first place to look i tell people is right around baseboards you know you can probably feel it feel the air drafting up through the baseboards or through places like that the simplest thing you can do is buy a tube of caulking and caulk that area stop the air from coming in Again, the, the whole basic idea of heating a house is you want to put enough heat in the house to get it warm. But the secret of a really well-insulated house is that the heat stays in the house. You don't and in a drafty to. house, it, 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 it just comes and goes. In it, a drafty uh, house, your heat system is fueling a convective loop. Your heating system is, is heating air up which, by the way, is taking the moisture out of the air, out of your house. It is rising up because colder air is replacing it, forcing it up. And it's finding the holes in the top half of the house. So it's going out, and that's being driven even faster by the heating system. Because you've got to keep heating the cold air, which is coming in. It's rising up because of the your BTUs that you're putting in. So by sealing those those leaks, you're stopping that convective loop way, way, way cutting back the amount of BTUs to keep warm. So uh, a well-insulated house is cheaper to heat because we keep the heat in the house. Right. Uh, we, you might be reheating the house 30 times over a day. We might be reheating the house once or twice or whatever, you know, whatever the situation. It's just we're, we're keeping the heat in the house rather than sending it out through the holes. The other thing, if you're looking to air seal the first floor or the living rooms of your house, the first floor, second floor, uh, whatever parts are insulated and finished, uh, you want to look in the morning around the baseboards. Uh, that's the first place. Uh, look next to the windows. Quite often, uh, if your windows are leaky, quite often there's no insulation. Next to the window, there's a space between the framing and the window. If it's not insulated, uh, then there's cold air coming in there, and quite often there's drafts that come out around the cracks, around the trim around the window. This does not involve replacing the window. What it involves is taking the trim off, uh, filling the section next to the window with window and door, non-expanding spray foam, and spray it around the perimeter of the window, and that will stop the drafts. It doesn't have to be really thick as long as it forms a plug. Uh, the ideal way is to put it towards the outside of the house and then fill the rest of it with the type of insulation. But the most important thing is the air seal itself. So, kind of um, like the 60s, you're avoiding the draft. Right, right, exactly. Um, another place is if you have recessed lights in the house. Uh, mm -hmm. Recessed lights are notorious for sending heat out. Any other holes in the ceiling, exhaust fans, uh, anything else like that should be sealed if possible. Uh, it may be that there's an outside damper that's not working. It stays open all the time instead of closing. But you can lose a lot of heat through a, a four inch or a six inch hole in the ceiling. 
are there any other places you can think of, Wes? I mean, there's, there's holes and cracks everywhere, and the more you can cover, the better off you are. Well, one more place that it comes to mind right away is um, the chimney chase. There, by law, you can't have... Now, all the framing has to be two inches away from the masonry. Okay, so if that may all, also, you may have a gap. And really, that causes the, literally a chimney effect. The yeah, and I've seen that. I've seen that in new houses, actually, too, that that just gets forgotten. And what you can do is... There's a couple of things you can you can seal around the top with uh, some kind of metal, um, like uh, flashing, flashing. Just a roof a roof edge flashing works well. Uh, some kind of metal going right up against it, and uh, rock wool insulation, I believe, is fireproof. I think that's legal to tuck around the chimney mm -hmm. uh, if you can do it. That's another place. Then there can be a huge gap there that is just. You just kind of miss it. It has to be there in a certain sense, but doesn't have to be wide open. Uh, so I just the last thing I want to talk about is attics. If you're in an old colonial house, a, a two, full two-story house, there's probably a walk-up attic in it. And quite often there's a, there's a, uh, a very thin handmade uh, panel door at the bottom of the stairs or a board door uh, with a latch on it going up into the attic so you can open the door and walk up. The problem is that air doesn't need a very big hole to get through, and this whole thing is an enormous chimney going up to the coldest part of the house. And there's there's really there's two parts to this, but uh, the first thing is to decide if you want to heat the attic or not. If you want to include that in the uh, in your envelope, and you really should. If it's workable, if it's a workable space, if, especially if you've got a stairway up to it, you've got a high ceiling. It should be part of your envelope. If you're in an existing house, you don't want to spend the money to make it part of your envelope. At least put some kind of an insulated cover over the stairway on the top. You, you really can't insulate the door and the walls without redoing them completely. You're probably better off to just leave that as it is. And there are insulated covers available for pull down stairways. And they will work in that kind of an application. And I'm not sure if they're zippered or how they're how they're closed, but they're they have an insulated panel, and you unzip it or whatever, and open it. And they're airtight. Something like that will help a lot. Uh, keep the heat from going up into the attic, and cooling off the house. In a lot of houses, especially houses built in the last well 50 years, uh, you did not have a, a stairs up to the attic. Um, you had uh, a hole in the ceiling. And in a lot of houses, it's either a really thin piece of plywood uh, or, a, or a piece of uh, drywall. Uh, a lot of new houses I've seen, there's a piece of drywall there. Uh, drywall has a very low insulation effect, but worse, it's not this zero air sealing because even though it might be laying flat on something, uh, it's certainly not laying flat enough to keep the air from getting around it. And it's not weather stripped. You could buy insulated covers for attic hatches. Uh, just go online, Google it, you'll find them. You can build better ones, but these are uh, very worthwhile and a huge, huge, huge advantage to what's in most houses right now. And things like, like closing up the attic hatch, take off that piece of, that small piece of drywall that's up there Probably got a piece of fiberglass sitting on top, which maybe makes you feel good, doesn't do anything else. Do it right. It may take a little bit of time and it does cost a little bit, but most of it you can do yourself. I had this one room that was very leaky and I, and I really wanted to fix it, but I didn't have the blower door I needed to do it uh, to see where the leaks were coming in. What I did was I took a box fan and the, uh, the windows are... 24 by 48, so I could fit a box fan in the bottom half of this. The box fans are 20 inches. Uh, open the window, put the box fan in, and then I put some uh, cardboard around the edges and taped them with painter's tape onto the window uh, flashing in the, in, the, in the fan so that I was making my own blower door, essentially. Uh, and it worked great. I found a lot of leaks, and I patched them all, and that room is is quite nice to be in, much better than it was a few years ago before I did that. So this is kind of do-it-yourself uh, blow a door. You can do it uh, different size fans and a little bit of cardboard and 
and uh, painter's tape, you can do it anywhere in the house. But it's worth doing. These things are the most money for your buck. No, the least money for your buck. The, the least, least, the biggest least. bang for your buck. It's the most cost of cost effective things you can do in your house. Sadly, yeah. it's not very sexy. It's not putting panels on your roof. The neighbors aren't going to tell you've done it. Right. Hmm. Anyway, it's been um, fun as always. Uh, we should um, talk again soon. If I don't see you in the future. I'll see you in the pasture. Hi, this is Wes Gollum, the Energy Geek. I hope you found this video helpful and interesting. If you did, I would appreciate it if you would like it and subscribe to the Energy Geek channel. Please leave your comments below and thanks for watching. Want to learn more? Check out my new book and video series, Warm and Cool Homes.